Uh, this morning, um, if, we, if you can, please, let's open your Bibles to uh, Colossians. While you uh, open your Bible to the letter of Paul to Colossae, I just want to say good morning and thank you for having us over. I'm very happy to be here with you all to see you again. I wanted to ask you, as we prepare, open your Bibles to go to book of Colossians. Think about this morning, since the time you wake up until now. Uh, how many times have you expressed your thanksgiving to the Lord? Uh, what reasons cause you to offer thanksgiving to God? What, what things came to mind that you thank the Lord for? Now, since you got up until now, just do an inventory, just think about it. Uh, Lord willing, we'll talk about it in a couple of minutes, okay? I just want to bring that up to your remembrance. Let's go ahead and pray so the Lord will bless this time. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask for your help. We need your help, Lord. We need we need to hear from you. We need your word to feed our souls, to guide us, to show us how to live this Christian life, to show us more of your glory and who you are. And so, Father, be with us today. Prepare our hearts, our ears, our mind. Help me to clearly communicate the truths that are here in your word. Minister to us, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. And thank you for this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, Colossians. Um, let's go ahead and start with a little introduction. If you are in Colossians, you go to uh, verse, two, uh, verse 1 or chapter 2. We see that Paul is telling the Colossians in this letter, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. So the first thing we realize here is that Paul has not been in this church. He has not seen the brothers face to face. It's not a church that was planted directly by the Apostle Paul. If you go to chapter 1, uh, verse 6, you see that since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. So we see that the church Colossae was established by the ministry of the word by Epaphras. So not Paul, but Epaphras. He's a beloved brother. We know that Paul wrote the letter from prison. If you go to chapter 4, you will see in verse 3 that he says, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mysteries of Christ on account of which I am in prison. In verse 10, right around the same chapter, he says that Articus, my fellow prisoner, greet you. So he's in prison. He's not alone. He got others with him. Uh, verse 18, on that same chapter, you see that Paul write this greeting with my own hand, right? I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hands. And he said, remember my chains. So we know he is in prison when he's writing this letter. We don't know where specifically. It is believed that he's in Rome with his first imprisonment. At the time that Paul wrote the letter, Epaphras, the man who got used to found the church, is also in Rome and in prison with Paul. We see that uh, on that same chapter 4, verse 12. It says that Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greet you. So he's with Paul. And on Philemon, the letter we saw uh, last time I was here together, on verse 23, it says that Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, send greetings to you. So we can see that he's in prison together with Paul. So that's kind of a little bit of the background of where we are. Uh, the letter was delivered 
uh, to the church collapsed by Titicus. Uh, uh, we see that on 4.7. So that letter is coming from Rome, most likely. Paul in prison to the Colossians. And it opens this way. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. That's, that's the first two verses. It's Paul greeting. He's saying, hi. How are you? This is who I am. And here, on these two verses, um, I want to ask us to think. How, how, how are we to think of Paul as the way he introduced himself? How, how are the Colossians receiving this letter are to think of Paul, who they haven't seen face to face? They just heard of him. All right? So how are they to think? Well, first thing that Paul tells them is that he's an apostle. He's one who, who was commissioned, who was sent. By whom? Well, he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. So he's one who is sent to speak, to deliver a message of Christ Jesus. But look what he says there. That he's not an apostle by his own will. If you're familiar with the book of Acts, chapter 7, 8, 9, we see Paul when he was Saul persecuting the church. And there on the chapter 8, we see that he goes from house to house on his own initiative because he's zealous for the name of God, persecuting the church. And in chapter 9, he goes before the chief priest and he says, hey, I want to go after these Christians. Give me letters. So, so he takes the initiative and he asks for letters that will give him power as he goes out to other regions persecuting the church. And with those letters given to him by the chief priest, he can go to Damascus and he can take the Christians, bind them, and drag them to Jerusalem, put them in prison. See, he did all that out of his own initiative. He's zealous for the Lord. But here, he's telling the Colossians, this was not my idea. It, it, it was not me who decided now I'm going to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm not self-appointed like we see many today. Self-appointed apostles. All right? But Paul want to make sure they understand something very, very important. That he's not there on his own accord. He's not writing to them on his own authority. And he's not sending them his own message. He's just an apostle. He's just a messenger appointed by the living God, by the will of God. And now he's writing a message in the name of Christ Jesus. Christ the Messiah. Christ the Anointed. Christ the King, the promised King, the one who the Jews have been waiting for. It's been almost a thousand years since King David. They've been waiting for that one descending from David that will sit on the throne and that will rule according to the promises they have. And that one is Jesus, the Christ. And Paul is giving them a message from this king. And that message is coming with the authority of this king. We hear Christ when he appears after the resurrection, after he conquered death. He appeared to his disciples and he says, all authority has been given to me. Go, therefore. See, and what authority they are to go? In the authority that has been given to him. Look, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, he tells us that Christ ascended after he selected by the Spirit, His apostles, those who He was sending. And as we saw or talked 
In the book of Acts, chapter 9, we see that the same Christ appeared to a man called Saul, who was self-appointed to persecute the church and had an encounter with the living Christ, who at that time commissioned him to be his apostle, who at that time gave him a message to deliver to the Jews, to the Gentiles, and to kings. And to kings. Because he's going on behalf of he who is the king of kings. So Paul, when he speaks as an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, he is speaking with an incredible authority. Who God has testified. And we read the book of Acts, we see it over and over again. All the miracles and the mighty power of God working through Paul. So that Paul, we must listen. Right? So, sometimes we're so familiar with our Bibles, we just read. But take a minute and listen. Because this message is not Paul's message. This message is Christ's message for his church, for Colossae. And by the power of God, this letter to the church of Colossae was preserved for us today. So Christ is speaking not only to the Colossians, but to us. So to this Paul, we must listen because he speaks with the authority and the power of the living Christ, the Lord Jesus. And what do he say? How are we to think of Paul and his companions after hearing Paul the Apostle? Well, we see there that he talks about Timothy. He sends greetings too. Timothy and Paul sends greetings. And look what he said about Timothy. Our brother. Now, we are to think of others that are on the same faith as brother. Listen how he addressed them in verse 2. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Again, we just saw that Paul has not seen them face to face. Timothy, we can see. All right. Paul has been walking around, working with Timothy for years. He's been stunned to death. Timothy's been taking care of him. He's been serving him, walking with him, encouraging him. They're Jews. So they have something in common. So they're brothers. Paul and Timothy, brothers. But that's not what he says. He says, our brother. Timothy, our. He's including them. The Gentiles Colossians into this relationship. And when he speaks of them, he uses, he uses two words that coming from a Jew, this Jewish man, is incredible. He calls them saint. You understand what that means? He's a Jew. He's of the people that the Lord told them, he himself, the Lord, revealed himself to them and told them, of all the people of the world, I have chosen you to be my precious possession. That's why the Israelites were saints, because they were set apart for God. And Paul is taking these words, holy one, set apart ones, saints. And he's applying that title to the Colossians. That's just incredible. What he's saying, what has God done? And then he calls them brothers. They, he has not seen them. But because they have faith in Christ, because they believe in Christ, the brothers. 
We're one in Christ, one family of the faith. You and I, if you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, we're brothers. Even if we haven't seen each other before, we're brothers. We're brothers in Christ. We're saints. How we think of us. We are saints because we have been set apart by God to be part of this union in His beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So how are we to think of Paul, an apostle speaking with power, sent by Christ, the words of Christ, the message of Christ being delivered by Him? How are we to think of others? They are in the faith. They are our brothers. And how are we to think of ourselves? If we are in Christ, if we have faith in Christ, we're saints set apart by God. He's, he, he delights. You know, He set us apart. He says down, we're going to read it later, He says that He took us from the dominion of darkness to place us in the kingdom of His beloved Son. We're, we're set apart. If you're in Christ, that's who you are. So that's how you ought to think of yourself. Now, if we're in Christ, what do we have? It says, verse 2, second half of the verse, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ, our Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. That's part of the salutation. And you pretty much are going to find that in every letter that Paul writes. Peter uses that also. And at times, we can get so familiar with it that we miss the significance. Because it's what we have. We have the grace of God. And we have peace from God. Look at, look at your verse. Uh, let me see, where am I? Having difficulty following my notes. All right, so let's go to Colossians 4.18. Last verse of the, of the book. Look how he finished. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. How do he start? Grace to you. Everything that is in between chapter 1 and chapter 4 is guarded by the grace of God. What is that? What are we talking about? What is, what is grace? Colossians 1.5 Colossians 1.5 says, Because of the hope laid out for you in heaven. Of these you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Verse 6. Which has come to you, and indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood. Right? So something came to them that they heard it and understood. What was that? The word of truth, the gospel. Right? But look how he finished verse 6. What they understood, what they heard, which was the word of truth and the gospel, he finished saying that is the grace of God in truth. They understood the gospel, 
They understood the word of truth. At the same time, Paul is saying that that is the grace of God in truth. We understand grace to be a gift, a gift, unmerited gift. We understand that by grace we are safe, right? So it is a gift of God of salvation that, is, that it comes to us through the word of truth, the gospel. So grace to you, saints, grace to you. The peace of God to you. Grace is the gift of God of salvation for those who put their faith, their trust in Christ Jesus. And that gift has a result of having peace with God. That's how we start the letter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Look how personal that is. Is, is. is our Father the reason why we are brothers if we are in Christ? Is our Father who gives us, is, is coming from Him a wonderful gift of grace? The gift that is found in the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is a gift that He grant to us from Him grace. From Him peace. You're not longer an enemy of God, but now you're a child. He's your Father. It's just amazing. Amazing to see that, to live in that reality, to be in Christ. What does it mean to you? Are you in Christ? Do you know of this grace? Do you know this peace? Is God your Father? Is that your reality? Can you look at another who has that same experience and rejoice together, my brother, my sister, in Christ? In Christ. So that reality that we have the grace and the peace from God, that reality causes Paul to give thanks to God. That's verse 3. That's where we're going next. We always thank God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See? This God that he's thanking is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, do you see that? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is your father. The same father that we see in verse 3 is the same father that is on verse 2. And it is the same father who grants us grace and peace. We always thank God. Remember that question I asked you at the beginning? What were you thankful for? From the time you wake up until now, what 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 reasons move you to say thank you, Father? Express those words, thanks, giving, thank you. I asked that question to a couple other people during the week, and uh, I was told, "Well, I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful for my wife." I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my car, for my house. But I ask you a question. If those things were taken away, 
like Job. Right? He lost all of that. You still have a reason to be thankful? Will thanksgiving flow from your lips to God? That's the title of this message is the reason for thanksgiving. Here we have Paul. We already saw that he was in prison, in chains. And he is thanking God. Do you have a reason to thank God? If all these other things are taken away, if your health goes, if your job goes, if your prosperity goes, if a loved one dies, if you find yourself alone, do you still have reason to be thankful? Paul does. He does. And part of it is what we saw before, the grace and peace that come from God. Part of it is that he's in Christ. So let's, let's hear Paul. Let's read Colossians 1, 3 through 8. Because we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of these you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, and indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is, faith, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Your love in the Spirit. So, what is Paul thankful for? According to what we just read. What is he giving, thanksgiving to God? He's definitely giving thanksgiving. Say that again? For the church that is there in Colossae, who he did not plant. But there is a church there. The message of the gospel arrived at Colossae. And he's thanking God for that. Why do you think he's thanking God for it? He is a minister of this gospel message. And he is bound in chains, in prison. Yet, the gospel is set loose. The gospel is advancing, is conquering. And it doesn't depend on Paul. Who is he thanking? He's thanking God because it is God who is advancing this gospel message. It is Him who is working in that church at Colossae. And what is this gospel message doing in Colossae? It says, He heard of their faith in Christ Jesus. And that Cause him to thank God. Because they have faith in Christ Jesus. He heard of their love that they have for all the saints. Verse 8, it says that Epropha has made known to them their love in the Spirit. You see, this gospel message got to Colossae. But it didn't get, it, it just, it's just not there doing nothing. It's working. It's producing. It's advancing. It's making them give fruit. 
And that fruit is one, faith, steadfastness, faith in Christ Jesus. And two, love for one another. Love for one another. And Paul tells him that that love flows from the spirit that is in them. Now the question is, how is that active in us here? If that is active in the Colossian church and is causing Paul in prison to thank God, what would he do if he hears a report about us here in Ladeo? How is the love for one another working out in the foundation of the gospel message, of the truth, of the peace and the grace from God in this church, in your life? How is the faith in Christ Jesus growing and abounding in your life and overflowing to minister to those around you in the same faith. Those who are brothers in Christ Jesus. For other reasons, the Paul thanks God for. He thanks God that this gospel message is not only a colasse working and giving fruit, but it's advancing in the whole world. It's advancing in the whole world. Read, let's read uh, verse 9 through 14. He says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a matter worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, he, the Father, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The gospel message working in Colossae and in the church at Colossae is causing Paul to give thanks to God because it is God who has taken you from the dominion of darkness and placed you in the kingdom of His beloved Son. And it is God working through the message of the gospel, working through the message of the word of truth that is advancing and conquering and breaking the domain of the kingdom of darkness over people. It is Him working through the message. And yet, Paul strives to make that message known to everyone. And how was this church planted? The church at Colossae? Through the efforts of Paul? We saw that already. No. Through the effort of another. Not Paul. But Epaphras. Brothers and sisters, I, I ask a question. And I'm actually going to read it. Because Paul asked the same question. He has in Romans 10, verse 14, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone 
preaching. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to believe? If not one preach. Paul was not in, F, in uh, I'm sorry, I was going to say Ephesus. Paul was not in Colossians, in Colossae. He never seen those saints face to face. It is believed that Paul, during his time in Ephesus, when he was there laboring, the book of Acts tells us that he was there for more than two years, preaching and teaching. That Epaphras, Philemon, those who were in Colossae doing business or for, for some reason went to Ephesus. They heard the word of truth. They heard the gospel. They believed. They sat and learned from Paul and they went back to Colossae. And what did they do? They stay at home. They prosper in their business. No, they couldn't contain it. They shared the good news, the gospel. And as this good news, this gospel, was set loose, God started working, transferring people from the kingdom of darkness, the domain, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of his beloved son. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation for those who believe in it. We who believe in it, we have a powerful, powerful message. We don't need to change it. We don't need to water it down. We don't need to do anything to it to make it more appealing because it is not our message. An apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul, by the will of God, he delivered a message, faithfully delivered the message from his king without changing it. And his king did the work. And we need to believe that that message from King Jesus is enough and sufficient. And we need to stand believing that he who delivered that message, our Lord Jesus Christ, has the power to conquer the kingdom of darkness. And we need to be bold and let that message loose. Trusting that God will do His work. But we need to be faithful to it. Faithful. Because the wrath of God is coming. I want you to go to chapter 3, verse 6. Look what he says there. The wrath of God is coming. You see it? It's in chapter 6. Does that sound like good news? It doesn't sound like good news. But it's the truth. The wrath of God is coming. Do you see that? Do you have the urgency because the wrath of God is coming? On account of what? Verse 5, verse 7 tells us that the wrath of God is coming on account of sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. It tells us that the wrath of God is coming because of anger in the sinful man, because their wrath Malice, slander, and obscene talk. 
because of lying to one another, deceiving one another, because of our rebelliousness towards God. The wrath of God is coming, and that is not good news. But that is the backdrop that make the message of the grace and the peace from God a gospel message, a good news. You have a good news. It's been given to you to be a faithful minister of it, to share it because the wrath of God is coming. And God has a gift, a grace that he offers, which is Christ Jesus. And through him, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. And that reason is what made Paul thank God. I thank God. Because the peace of God, the grace of God, is in you. I, I thank God. I, I thank God. Because that faith in Christ is working in you. It's real. Because there is love for the brothers. There is trust in Christ. There is steadfastness. There is hope in your life. Paul says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1.12, that's what he says. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, it is him, the Father, who we thank because he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. He redeemed us from our sins. It is our sins that caused that the wrath of God was coming and was over us, and he redeemed us. And because of that, we give thanks. Paul gives thanks on verse 3. And he gives thanks in verse 12, or though in verse 12, he's actually play, praying for the, Coloss for the Colossians to be a people that express thanksgiving when they think and they meditate and they see the reality of what the grace of God has done in them, which is that he has qualified them to share in the kingdom of light. That is that he has transferred them from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's the reason to give thanks. So again, I ask you, if all those things we mentioned earlier were taken from you, do you have a reason for expressing thanksgiving to our God? Do you know the grace of God? Do you have peace with God? Because if you don't, then the wrath of God is upon you. And that is not a good news. And that has no hope. No hope. But the Colossians, they rejoice. They have hope in heaven. Because there is their hope. There is their Christ. And in Him they have peace with God. So do you have peace with God? Do you have reason for thanksgiving? Paul wants the Colossians to be a people full of thanksgiving to God. Because they have the reason for thanksgiving. Look what Paul said. I'm, I'm again going to Romans, Romans 121. Hear what he says. For although he's, he's speaking about those who are in enmity with God, those who have not put their trust 
in Christ Jesus. Look what he says about them. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Characteristic of those who are not in Christ, so those who are in enmity with God, is that they do not give thanks to God. What describe, what, what should be one of the characteristics of the life of the Christian? We who possess the reason for thanksgiving. It should be a life full of thanksgiving. And look what Paul tells the Colossians. We're going to go to Colossians, a couple of verses here. Look at uh, Colossians 1.12. We're there already. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. We are to give thanks to the Father because he has qualified us. Go to Colossians 2, 6, 7. It says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him, root it, and build up in him, and establish in faith, just as you were taught, abounding, abounding, in thanksgiving. Why? Why should we abound in thanksgiving? Because we have received Christ Jesus the Lord. We have reason. We had the reason to abound in thanksgiving. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Put on then, as God chosen one, the saints, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing one another, and if one has complained against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So also must forgive. So you also must forgive. And above all this, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, that you were, you were called to be in peace with God, and you were called in one body, and be what? Thankful. Be thankful. Why? For everything that he has just mentioned, you have the reason to be thankful. 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How? With thankfulness in your heart, to God. Your heart, Christian, should be a heart that overflow in thanksgiving to God for what He has done for us in Christ Jesus. Never lose sight of your Savior. No matter what situation you are find yourself, you of all people, have a reason for thanksgiving. Even if you're in chains, in prison, you have hope that is stored for you in heaven cannot be taken away and is sure. Thankfulness, Christian. Abounding in thankfulness for what He has done for you. Verse 17. And whatever you do, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through Him. Giving thanks in everything you do. And everything means everything. In speech or in deed. Thanking God for His salvation. Thanking God for the work of Christ in that cross. 
you of all people. You have the reason for thanksgiving. And thanksgiving to abound in all situations, in everything you go through. Colossians 4.2 Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Colossians have four chapters. And in every single one of them, Paul is giving us a reason to abound in thanksgiving. And he's calling the Colossians and God, by preserving this letter, is calling us to be a people abounding in thanksgiving. But that is only going to happen if you keep your eyes set on your hope that is in heaven. In the gospel message, the good news of our King Jesus Christ. So, brothers, be thankful. In all situations, I'm studying Job with my kids. And in Job 27 8, it says, For what is the hope of the godless when God cut him off? When God takes away his life? What is their hope? What is your hope? If your hope is in Christ Jesus, you have reason for thanksgiving. Let's pray. Father, <laughs> Father, our Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your gift, for, for Christ. for demonstrating your love for such a people as us by giving, by giving the most precious, the most precious being, our Lord Jesus Christ, by him humbling himself and taking, taking the form of man. In carrying my sins, my sins, our sins. And do not getting down on that cross, but withstanding your wrath, the wrath of God that is coming, in which I was spared, in which we who hope in you are spared. What a great news. What a reason for joy and thanksgiving. We have peace with God. Thank you, Father, for your gift. Thank you. Help us to be our minds set on you, to see Christ, to appreciate Him, to appreciate what you've done for us, and to walk in a manner worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Him we pray. And in Him we hope. Amen.